I was born in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I mean, my uh, early childhood years can just be traced by Air Force bases. Uh -huh. So we started at Sandia Air Force Base, and then we went from there to Taiwan, and then from there to Hampton and Langley Air Force Base in Virginia, and then California uh, in the high desert, George Air Force Base, which is now closed, actually. But, um, and we ended up being there for the duration. We were supposed to go on to Germany, but then the Vietnam conflict started up, and my dad served his first tour there for four months and came home, and he was almost at 20 years at that point. He was 40 years old. He turned 40. I remember his 40th birthday, and he had a choice of serving 100 more missions or, or uh, working in the Pentagon, and he chose he didn't want to work in the Pentagon. It, I think his love was really for flying. I don't know. I. You know, this might be up um, for debate, but I don't. I think his love was flying that plane. I don't know. I never considered him a warrior because my memories of him conflict with that. But I don't know him. I don't didn't know him in that way. He's a very professional, dedicated, um, lifelong career service. You know, Air Force pilot. But I think flying the planes was what brought him the most pleasure. He flew the F-104 for the first, one of the first pilots to fly the F-104 and. It was an exciting childhood. What do you remember about your childhood? Oh, your father as yeah. Well, as being young? Yeah, we have so many. I feel really fortunate because he was an incredibly adventurous person. Um, when we were in Taiwan, he learned one of the island dialects and moved us up into the mountains of Beitou instead of living on the Air Force Base. You know, he never wanted us, he wanted us to really experience the culture, and he had a particular love for Asian culture. So he learned uh, one of the um, indigenous dialects on the island, which I'm sure was, you know, something like Chinese. And we moved across the street from this family compound. He got to know everybody in that compound. And they would actually have us over for dinners. And he just wanted us to experience it because he, he was so um, enthralled by it. And then while we were there, too, he built a sailboat down in the boat yards in Taipei with uh, local craftsmen. So they built this lightning, 30-foot lightning sailboat. And that's what my memory is of him, of uh, us trailing after him. We'd go out to the islands, and he'd, he'd border for the big glass balls that the fishermen used, and uh, he'd talk to people, you know. And so we were always right there with him. And so I just remember a childhood just adoring him and just um, wanting to be like him, you know. And he was really encouraging. A loving person, you know, he loved his kids. He always said, you know, he wished he could have five more. There were five of us, a pretty big family. Um, and so it was a real hardship to lose him. And I think my, I mean, he was just the center of our family. And so, you know, he knew, and we, I guess we all knew, at 11 you don't really articulate it, that he might not come back, but it never, I never believed it, you know. In a minute, so you had five kids. Where are you in the chronology? Right in the middle, right. so <laughs> the dead have center. Older brother or sister? Um, I have two older sisters, and I had a younger brother who I've since lost, and a baby sister. Okay. So. And was uh, your mother? Yeah, yeah. My mom must have been about 38 at the time he was shot down. Mm -hmm. Would you know where your mother and father met? You know their yeah, story? they, they were uh, right. they were raised in the Santa Cruz Mountains, in Boulder Creek, and my dad, who lost his dad at at age of eight, was raised alone by his mom in Ben Lomond, California. And my mom and dad met in high school. Then they both went off to college, and he actually went off to another, down to um, California to go to school for a while, came back, they fell in love, and then he went off to officer's training, and when he came back, they got married. And then from there, his career started. So they went from there to Albuquerque, and that's where three of us were born. So. Um, yeah. Did he always want to be a pilot? Why did he join the You know, I don't know. His, mm -hmm. uh, his brother, uh, Helmuth Paul Schmidt, was killed in a training mission off the coast of Florida during World War II. And I think that inspired my dad. His sister was a pilot. And she claims that she was the one who inspired him because she, she took him up flying. I don't know for sure. I know he had an, a, a really deep love for it and, um, you know, just it was his creative outlet, you know, that's what he did. Um, so that's the person I remember. He had always loved flying. So did you ever, did, do you remember any discussions around the family about 
about the Vietnam War before, as it began to escalate before we ever left for it um, with the, on the news or newspapers? Yeah, or I do. I remember a news. really difficult conversation. My sister, who was older, she was in her teens, and um, he came back from his first tour, and she asked him if he killed any women and children because she was hearing those things. You know, and I think, honestly, as a pilot, he felt a little insulated from, I mean, he was a you know, highly intelligent, thoughtful person, but I think he, you know, he was above it, and I just remember how shaken he looked when she asked him that question, and he tried to reassure her that, no, it was, they were looking for military uh, ammunition stockpiles, and really his job was in this little tiny jet, this sports car of a jet, was to run, um, I can't think of the terms, but you know, they were the lookout for the bigger bombers. And, but I remember him feeling very shaken. And he, he was missing for eight years. We waited for him. We, um, they could never confirm he was in prison camp, but they, we believed he was, you know, and he was. But so his first mission, or his first tour, do you know when that was? That would have been in 1965. 1965, and it was four months? Yeah. And uh, so he returned from that first mission, yeah, and yeah. that's when these discussions took place. Right. Did he, did he relate to any other experiences that he had uh, during those, that first tour? Um, I have all his letters, so he talks a lot about all the details. Um, we have four volumes of these letters. Um, he wrote to my mom every day, and so he talks definitely about being right there. He was at Udorn, in Thailand, Udorn Air Force Base in Thailand, and he talks, again, he had a, lo a love for Asian culture, so he talks a lot about the people. I, I have a theory and, um, or a sense that he was mystified by why we were there or what we were doing. Um, but that, you know, I can't speak for him. Why do you get that sense? What leads you to that? that Just things that prisoners came back that told us, things that he said. And um, he just didn't understand what we were dragging out. You know, why? I, I don't think he, and again, I'm just guessing. I can't speak for him. He was uh, incredibly um, honorable in the sense that he had signed an oath, and that's that's what he was doing. But um, yeah, I, I think I think he felt troubled by it. But I, I can't, you know, I can't be sure of that. Uh, so his second tour. Do you know when he left for his second tour? Um, he left on in July of 1966. Do you remember? Did you see? Did you? Did the family see him off? What was that day like? What was that day? Terrible. My mother was just devastated. He was 40. He, um, and he was devastated. You know, he spent weeks trying to fix up everything around our house. We had a horse corral. He, he repaired the corral. He was doing this incredible Spanish tile floor in our house. He was trying to get those tiles set. He just felt bad, you know. And he was 40. <laughs> and, um, he, he kept promising us, this is it, you know, when you come back, we're going to fly to Germany, we're going to spend two years there, and that's it with the Air Force, and we're going we're to end it on a high note, you know, and um, yeah, it was very difficult. So what happened on July 1st of 1966, do you remember? September 1st, you mean? Maybe September 1st. Yeah, that's yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I was riding, I can remember the details vividly, I was, I rode my bike home, <laughs> Through the hot desert, we lived way out in the middle of the desert. We were very isolated at the time. It's not isolated anymore, but at that time it was a very small community, which is again was his choice. He wanted us out there, so I was riding my bike back from a uh, piano lesson in 105 degree heat, and I got home and I knew something was wrong. My older sister was there, and um, she was pleading with me to help her clean the house real quick. And what had happened, sadly was the, my mother was a school teacher, so she was out at her school getting ready, because it was September, you know, it was time to get ready for the school year, and so the men in the dark blue cars had driven up, you know, and um, they had to break the news to my sister, um, who I think was 14 or 15, um, and so she knew that, you know, things were going, and she didn't want to have to tell us. And, um, and then just, you know, maybe 40 minutes later, everybody else pulled up with my mom. They had gone out to get her at her school. And I just remember it being a confusion um, of people descending on the house and, um, you know, being assured that he was alive, that there had been warning signals from his airplane. Um, the, the plane had exploded. 
but someone heard the warning signals as he um, parachuted down to the ground. And so I just remember a lot of military people, a lot of people around us. And then I think um, at the time it was, people thought it was helpful, but families just separated us. I went with one family, my sisters went with others, and so I didn't even see my mom for probably two days, you know. But yeah, I just remember it uh, just being a flurry. You know, and I, again, I'm just, I have a childhood view of it, so. Year 11, was it, it was confusing. Why did they separate members of the family? I just think they thought they were years. helping my mom, that she could mm. better manage, you know, because my little sister was only three, so I think she stayed with my mom, but I, I think that was just the feeling. They thought if they got us all away, then she could have some time to gather her wits, you know, and figure out where we were going from there. And did they tell you officially that, you know, uh, Colonel Schmidt had been shot down? Yeah. Over, do you know where it was? Um, it was over, uh, you know, it was in North Vietnam. He and another pilot, he'd been in the New York Times a couple days before because they had discovered a munitions island. So they were pretty stoked about it. That, and he mentions it in his last letter, he was going back, um, you know, to finish off this munitions stockpile. Um, and, you know, so he shot down over, no over North Vietnam. So that clearly was a difficult day. How did the days play out after that, uh, in the first week and then um, the next month? You know, just a cloud. Yeah, I mean, we kept thinking, and there was an immediate rescue mission. In fact, I just met this year, my, uh, my whole family met um, Bob Lilac, who was on the rescue mission who flew in. He was, my father was the squadron leader, and Bob Lilac was one of his pilots. And 15 minutes after my dad was shot down, they were trying to rescue him. And one pilot was killed trying to rescue him. They just didn't make it in time before he was captured on the ground. Um, yeah, it was just, we just kept waiting for him to come back, you know, that everything was going to be okay. And then it just blends into, no, I can't explain it, waiting eight years for somebody you just, you're sort of in a bubble. You're holding your breath. You know, you don't, yet not, you know, it's not that every day is rough. I went on being a kid and um, my sisters and brother, you know, we went on living our lives. My mom went on teaching. But it was always with the assumption that he was going to be back. I mean, we, we felt sure of it. And then, you know, as the years went by, some things, some of the points I remember, the propaganda films, I don't know if you remember those, of the POWs. The North Vietnamese released these propaganda films, and we were supposed to, like, be glued to them to see if we could find my dad. And so there was this camera shot of his face, and it just came up like this. And my father had these incredibly heavy eyebrows. I mean, we laughed about them. And here was this kind of out of focus person, but um, you know, kind of focusing on his eyebrows. And so we were sure it was him. And it might have been. I, that's never been determined. But he only lived. For, he lived for a year, and then they killed him. Um, he was healthy. There was, it was just, it, and there's theories that it was because he was the highest ranking officer in the camp at that time, and they tended to do that kind of systematically, I guess. How, they, how do you know that they, they killed him? Well, um, there's just a lot of, there were a lot, there were a lot of witnesses. Um, there was, what was going on was called a um, communications purge. They'd go through periods where they just wanted no communication whatsoever between the prisoners and they enforced it by punishing people and torturing people and, and you know there's really nothing to get out of my dad by then a year had gone by but he was in during this communications purge he was he had finished it shower he had finished cleaning up and he was looking through a crack in a prison wall and he was just trying to check out because as i think i honestly think he felt it was his duty as as the ranking officer to check on people and make sure they were healthy and so he was looking and trying to get a sense of the other prisoners and a guard caught him because of this communications purge he was punished and the punishment was to be stalked to a bed for 10 days so he was in his cell with three other men and he was stalked to this bed and um, 10 days went by and nothing but during those 10 days there was just brutal um, punishment of people that they could hear and um, and then they came and got him and there were prisoners right from the now down from the interrogation room who could hear what was happening and he was tortured severely and then he was beaten to death so you know I don't know I you know I don't know 
the logic or, um, you know, if it was predetermined or I don't know what happened. So you were a girl when, when he was shot down and, and um, said he died within that year. Did you, how did it, do you remember how it impacted you specifically? Did you dream about him? Did you oh. have thoughts about him? Did you draw a picture? Did you write? How did yeah, you, how did you I wrote. Your, I'm a, I, I write. So I wrote, um, I did a lot of writing um, whenever I could. That was what I did. I had another sister who's an artist, so she, uh, that was how she expressed it. Um, he's just a person we thought about all the time and talked about. I mean, honestly, you know, all these years have gone by and we still talk about him every day almost. I mean, we just, he's just so much a part of us. And in that way, I feel really lucky um, because what I have of my dad is what an 11-year-old has. And you know, at 11, you, you're not disappointed in your parents. You're not disillusioned. You haven't gone through your teens. You know, so I just have this delight in this person that he was. That, I mean, I really believe he was, you know, because I just wasn't old enough to know better. And so that, that's a fortunate outcome of it, you know, and I feel really glad to have that. And then these letters, um, I can, uh, up until I was 40, and I'm, I'm no longer 40, but up until I was 40, I could, you know, I could be 27, say. I could find the letters he wrote when he was 27, and I could read those letters, and we were both 27. I mean, it was phenomenal, you know, that I could share that with him, or that he, maybe not share it with him, but he gave that to me because of all those letters. And so, yeah, as a kid, you know, we were so sure he was coming home. We just kind of waited. That's what we did for eight years, you know, and I think lifelong, as far as impact goes, I think, all of us are late bloomers. I'm the only one who got married and had kids. Well, my brother, I'm sorry, my brother had a daughter. But, um, you know, we, my, we didn't tend to marry and have families. And I always wonder if that had something to do with it. I did have a family and my brother had a daughter. So I, um, it's not across the board. But. Was there any, uh, did any of your brothers and sisters or your mother have any resentment that he chose to go back to Vietnam as opposed to going to the Pentagon? No, maybe not, uh, never resentment, because I just don't think it's in our vocabulary when we talk about my dad, but re certainly regret, um, you know, that he might have felt. I mean, he, when the prisoners came back, they shared a lot of things with us, and they laughed. They said, we know you guys better than you know you guys, because, I mean, they had so much time to talk. And, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I don't know, you know, I hope he didn't, because he had enough going on. Well, yeah, how, how did, and then we'll move on from, from this period, but, um, when news came that he was uh, had been was had, was dead, how did what was? Do you remember that day when oh, the news came? It, it, was kind of it was when the um, it was right around when the prisoners came home. You know, in 1973. Um, yeah, just devastation. Yeah, you know, no, he he was he he we, thought he was still alive, but for he had been dead for seven years. Yeah, he, yeah, we. I think be, we knew before that, and I think my mom did. I think they were starting to get intelligence. Um, she could speak to that more clearly than I could, but um, I, ca I still believed it. I, um, I think she had information. And it could have been that she told us before that. I know that the, um, the real casualties of the way it happened were his mom. He was very close to his mom. And as I said earlier, she'd already lost her other son in a training mission, you know, in wartime, and, um, you know, it killed her. She lost both her sons. Yeah, and when they came to tell her, he had, you know, he, in his directives, he said, I want you to tell my mom. And so even though, you know, I mean, I think they should have just let her be. She was ill at the time, and, you know, she was gone shortly after. So you wanted to have a, a remarkable life. You've accomplished a lot. Um, you seem like you're centered and balanced and <laughs> happy. I think I am. How did you, I guess, escape the gravity of, of those, those years? Oh. To, and do you still struggle with it at all? Yeah, you know, less than I did when I was younger. I, I struggled a lot through my 30s and 40s. I mean, I talked about it too much. I dwelt on it. And uh, when the Abu Ghraib incident happened, I was just shaking, you know, physically, because it just hit me so personally. So I started writing about it, and I submitted to the New York Times. I wrote editorials. I was so angered because part of what I, and again, um, what I remember about my dad was, you know, as an American, you had certain values, 
and certainly one of them was that you never torture because we're an example to the world you know that was how he felt so that was a real rough year for me but to be honest after I wrote those pieces or a piece about that kind of let go of something and I haven't really talked very much about it anymore I think about him all the time but it's always framed in positive ways and yeah there's some really rough nights where you wake up in the night and you think about it and because he lived for exactly a year I mean, 364 days or four and a half days. Any day of the year, like in the heart of winter, you know, I can think, what was this day that year like for him? Was he cold? You know, was he hungry? Because really the most difficult thing is to know that he was so alone when he died. You know, he, it, that's just very, very painful to live with, you know, because we, we had such a warm affection for him. Uh, yeah, that's that's the most difficult thing. And again, I mean, here I am after you know, all these years. So it doesn't really go away. How did you meet the fellow POWs that he was uh, encountering? How did they find you? Did um, they, seek you out? they sought us out. Bob Shoemaker. I don't know if you've ever seen that film. They did um, Return with Honor. I think it was. Um, he was one of his um, cellmates, so he did a long tape for us that I still have which was really wonderful. And then um, Alan Lurie was in a cell next to him. Never saw his face, but they did a tapping conversation. And he was from my hometown, or at that time, Apple Valley, California. And so he came back and found me at high school when I was a senior in high school to tell me he tapped with my dad. And then just last November, Bob Lilac contacted us and he said they were dedicated in F-104. and. Um, among pilots, flying the F-104 is a real thrill. You know, everybody wants to fly the F-104, and so Bob Lilac had also flown it. So they dedicated this F-104 to my dad in, last November. Um, so it still it keeps coming up, and I think with the internet, you know, I, I hear from people with fair regularity. It's interesting, you know. So when did you get married? Well, I got uh, married real young. That didn't work out, but I came to Montana and married a native Montana. And when I was here in the MFA program, I uh, married Kim Zupan. He was born and raised in Montana. That's why I stayed. <laughs> and I'm really glad to have stayed, so. Does uh, MAI POW Day have special meaning to you? Um, yeah, I always acknowledge it in my heart, but I never do anything. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't do anything active, but I certainly always think about it. Or when I see one of the flags, and you still see the flags. Yeah. So you self-adjusted, basically. I mean, is, is, is this a natural process of coping with loss? Like, uh, say, if someone lost a parent in a car crash? Or yeah, you know, uh, like I said, in my 30s and 40s, I talked about it all the time. I felt like I, uh, my family had suffered the worst thing that could happen to anybody. Well, as you get older, you realize, you know, everybody's suffered, you know. And people are suffering. I mean, there are Vietnamese families who've suffered, you know. I mean, I don't have any... I guess I just, as I, it's part of wisdom, I guess. Um, I'm deeply, deeply saddened to have lost my dad, but I've gained some things. My mother has gained. She really got her footing, and so it's proud to look at her. He would be very proud of her, because I think she was a fairly dependent on him, and now she's a, she's an 86-year-old independent fireball. You know, I mean, really, she's amazing. So I guess I look more now at what came out of it that that we can be grateful for. What's your in retrospect, what do you, uh, when the Vietnam War is talked about, uh, the still a polarized uh, decade, what, what, how, what, what are your views? Um, um, you know, I think it was a, a terrible, terrible waste. Um, and I've heard that from military men. Um, there's a general who came and talked to m my mom and some other wives, and he said, I'm sorry. He said, I wish I could tell you your husband's died for a reason. He said, but. And, and I, but I don't, I don't feel any bitterness. I think we do this all the time. I mean, I'm sorry. I just think war, you know, I have an aversion now to a war that I wouldn't have had, I don't think, and war films. And um, I just get this horrible sense of, you know, what are we doing, you know? And my sister and I talk, ba talk about a kind of a pilgrimage to Hanoi, because you can go into the uh, Hanoi Hilton, and it, um, I'm, you know, we're torn about it. We talk about it just to honor him, you know? go back to where he last was, but he, uh, you know, I don't know if we'll ever have the chutzpah or courage to do that, <laughs> you 